Bạn Hi everyone. Good afternoon, um, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Neil uh, is our guest uh, today, um, a professor of philosophy of mind and psychology, cognitive science, uh, in Georgia State University. Dr. Neil, I'm happy to see you. Hey, great, great to be here. Uh, I really appreciate your having me on and, and inviting me to to discuss. Uh, various ideas and, and including just to show the audience uh, my new book which just came out called Religion as Make Believe. So there's there's the cover there's a cover for everyone so you know what it looks like and um, that was the occasion for this this uh, talk and I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Thanks very much. We'll we'll have Dr. Thank Van der Rit's book link in the uh, in the YouTube comments. If you look if you look down below the video we'll have links there. And uh, uh, Neil, is there anywhere that you would like people to look you up if they want to look at your work or find out more about you online? Do you have any preferred social media or, or other outlets for, for people who are interested? Yeah, sure. You can look me up by name, Neil Van Leeuwen, on academia.edu or Phil Papers. I'm also on Facebook if you want to friend me and on Instagram if you want to follow me there. And even LinkedIn would work too. So anyone can look me up and I'm, I'm happy to uh, connect with your audience. Thanks so much. And of course, yeah. while you're here to our audience, uh, do please subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, share your views in the comments and so on as we continue to bring you philosophical content and explore interesting ideas with interesting people. So uh, let's, let's kick off. We, we looked at, based on, your, uh, based on discussions before the chat, uh, your paper, The Trinity and the Light Switch, Two Faces of Belief, and your new book, which is Religion as Make-Believe, A Theory of Belief, Imagination and Group Identity. So these are obviously on related themes and ideas. Would you like to tell us perhaps what, what this area is about for you and to summarize uh, some of the ideas in your book and paper and where, what your positions are? and uh, the, the centrality of the ideas that are, are most interesting and important to you at, at present. Yeah, I'd love to. The, the general theme of my work is that human beings, including all of us listening and talking here, relate to ideas in very different ways. And this is a form of cognitive flexibility that I think is central to who we are as human beings. And I think one thing that's important for philosophy and psychology to do is not look only at the content of ideas, right? Those, that's always changing. But what are the different relations that people can be in uh, to the ideas that they have? And so a few years ago, well, actually 2014 already, I published a paper called Religious Credence is Not Factual Belief. And the idea of that paper was when generally people are in a more religious, reverential relation to their ideas, it's a different kind of cognitive relation from matter of fact belief, right? Like you believe that Athens is in Greece, you, you know, you believe that your names are, uh, um, you, you know, Demetrius and, uh, and, um, and Chris, right? Yeah, did I get that right? Demetrius and you Chris. Did. Yes. Okay. Good. Good. I got it. Well, belief is coming Perfect. from a good place right now. Yeah. Your, yeah. No, I was just with you. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, you saw me pause there. So. So. Yeah. I got to Got to get my my hosts down. Um. But yeah. Now. And I. I simply factually believe that. But when you when people believe, say, uh, uh, Jesus rose from the dead, um, it's a different cognitive relation from, uh, you know, thinking that. Uh, um, Barack Obama is alive or something like that. And so these are religious credence versus factual belief. And I think that religious credence, and this is the more provocative claim, is it's more like a kind of imagining. It's an imaginative attitude. It's an imagining that activates sacred values and in part determines your group identity. All right, and that was the theme of the Trinity and the light switch as well, right? So that's also the theme that comes out in my book. So one of the theses is religious credence and factual belief are different ways of relating to ideas. And the other one is that 
relig religious credence is more like the kind of imaginings that guide make-believe play. And hence the title religion as make-believe. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, already from when we we're kids on the playground, the games of make-believe that we're willing to play in part determine which group we belong to. And the, the kind of stunning, provocative, astonishing idea that I'm floating is that religion, it's also kind of intuitive that it's like this, but religion is like that, like a very large scale version of that, like a game of make-believe play that defines a group identity. So that's, I mean, it's very interesting. Obviously, we're in a period now where consciousness is uh, a deeply explored subject, and we've gone from uh, from work on heuristics, you know, the classic Kahneman uh, work on on uh, on groupthink and logical fallacies and heuristics, and kind of the collective uh, approach to to experience to a more nuanced view of neuroscience, and then philosophically we have. Uh, we have issues with uh, solipsism and hard problems of consciousness and, and Nagel and so on. So this is a, definitely, a, a, let's say, one of the current things. And it's, it's not, we haven't solved this issue, so it's clearly ripe for discussion. What, what led you to start to analyze these things in this way? What brought you to this subject and to this particular way of, of looking at it? Uh, is there a, a slow process? Was there some particular... Uh, catalytic uh, event or, or, or writer or author or anything like that? Well, it's always been of interest to me. I, I grew up in the Christian Reformed Church and my, my dad was ordained as a minister. Um, and my mom was also very devout. They're both academics. My dad was a biblical scholar and my mom okay. was an academic psychologist. But I went to church twice a week on uh, Sunday uh, and then also on Wednesdays when I was growing up. So very, very religious family. And it always struck me as there was some pretense going on. And so I, I ended up writing my PhD thesis in philosophy on self-deception, what it is to lie to oneself. But I don't think I fully had a satisfactory treatment of the phenomenon there. And then what happened was I went to work on more systematic philosophical questions, like what's the difference between simply believing something right, in the straightforward matter of fact way um, and imagining an idea. That's a problem that David Hume raised. And I always thought that was fascinating, again, because it, it goes to the heart of what it is to be human and to have the cognitive flexibility to relate to ideas in different ways. And then I was, I was thinking one morning and there was a sort of blitz moment, like a, you know, a lightning out of blue sky moment where it hit me that so many of the religious uh, um, believing attitudes that I had grown up around were more like the imaginings than they were like factual beliefs. Um, you know, and given given the framework that I independently uh, um, created, so the idea is that there's in my work is that there's there's ends up being two steps. There's the systematic philosophical step of saying, well, how does factual belief differ from imagining? Then you look at the evidence. Where does religious belief fall in that divide? So it was really one morning in the spring of 2010 that it hit me that even though you know religious beliefs are, are, are called beliefs, which for philosophers mean something different kind of uh, from what it means in, in lay speech, um, they're not the same kind of state or attitude as your, your mundane belief. Um, again, that Athens is in Greece or that that Barack Obama is alive or, you know, that cats have teeth and so on. Um, it's a different way of relating to ideas. But the fascination, I'll, just to wrap up the answer, the fascination was there kind of since childhood. I'm not religious anymore, but, you know, always pondering what it was I grew up around. And then there was a very, you know, sudden moment where I had kind of what I think is the core insight of my research program. And that was a, a, already a while ago, back in 2010. And what are the, the resources or the tools or methods of inquiry that you've used in effect to, to put some meat on the bones of, this, of these ideas and to 
to to to give them, if you like, some philosophical and, and empirical substance. What what are you? Are, have you got studies? Have you got work that you've been doing, or that you've been able to reference in relation to these? Yeah, so I I, I integrate a, a lot of different levels. So there's the systematic philosophical step. That's kind of the backbone where you say, well, if you had to non-circularly define what it is to distinguish imagining uh, and factually believing and other attitudes, like assuming for the sake of argument, supposing and so on. So you really have to do systematic theory construction in philosophy. But then when it comes to looking at the evidence, like what kind of mental state best explains this or that behavior, like performing a ritual, like mm. uh, professing your faith, like saying the, you know, the Apostles' Creed or sacrificing to the ancestors, all these behaviors, which kind of mental state explains them best? You have to look at the, the evidence from anthropology, uh, from cognitive science of religion. I look at historical evidence. When it comes to the neuroscience, the, the, the relevant evidence is a little bit thin on the ground, generally because the neuroscience of religion focuses a bit more on experience as opposed to um, standing belief states. Uh, but I'm hoping that will change. And then there's also some studies that I've done collaboratively that looks at linguistic behavior uh, that, that um, uh, I think supports my view. So the, the collaborative studies I uh, did with uh, psychologist Larissa, he Larissa Heifetz and another philosophy case, philosopher Casey Landers, and then um, follow-up studies cross-culturally with Tanya Lerman and Kara Weissman. And um, I'll just give you a sense of those. So if you have to fill in the blank, you say, Zane blanks that his bicycle is in the garage. You'd probably say Zane thinks that his bicycle is in the garage. But if you had to fill in the blank, Zane blank that Jesus rose from the dead, you'd probably say believe rather than think. So already you see that even lay people who are filling in those blanks, and this was, this was kind of our first study, they're more inclined to see the attitude one way than the other. And that's because this word believe in, in everyday English, it kind of indicates a notion of allegiance rather than the kind of dry cognitive, well, this is just how things are for me. And so we did that research and then we replicated it in different places using parallel uh, phrases and words in different languages. Um, and so we found the effect in, in pretty much everywhere we looked, right? In Ghana, in Thailand, in China, in Vanuatu, and then we replicated it also in the United States. So the, the point being, not only are there these different cognitive relations, factual belief versus religious credence, not only are people doing different things, but people are at some level at least intuitively aware that those are different. And um, they, you know, everyday speakers tend to use believe for the religious credence type attitude, and they just use think to report factual beliefs. Mm -hmm. That's painting the picture a little bit too neat, but um, we did get some pretty good effect sizes, and we like I said, found it wherever we look. So um, so yeah, mixed methods. And I'm still doing follow-up studies with a collaborator, uh, a new collaborator, Tanya Lombroso at Princeton University. We're doing, we're doing studies that'll help help validate some of these ideas. So I see the overall arc of the work as kind of helping transition from doing speculative philosophy to empirical research. Do you do you think that I, I think the concept of uh, let's say in group or uh, socially engineered heuristics and, and patterns of thinking is something that people intuitively understand, even if sometimes the research is is hard to to pin down precisely. Do you think because this is what you you're, you're writing about? there is something even more specific in this regard about religion. So something that separates religion from just, let's say, the need to be approved, the need to feel that you belong, or the fear of the other, or these broader, let's say, evolutionary psychology or in-group heuristics that people have. Is there something actually philosophically or empirically specific about religion and religious tenets that, that you, you think is relevant here? 
No, there's no sharp dividing line. I think maybe you get a cleaner example of the phenomenon in religion than you than you do in the political realm. Um, so with and that's why I, I kind of chose to start with religion. But the attitude of religious credence, it can be taken in relation to arbitrary contents. So you would normally think, well, who won the 2020 United States election? In the past, that was just, you know, people would have factual beliefs about who won the election. It would be a straightforward matter of fact thing. But a lot of people have something like a religious credence attitude toward the proposition that Donald Trump won the 2020 election, and that becomes an in-group marker. So the the it's a very important point, I'm glad you brought it up about my work, that I'm talking about cognitive relations that can be held in relation to arbitrary contents. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I say in my book is that anything can be sacralized. Mm -hmm. The efficacy of, of surgical masks in, in stopping the coronavirus can become uh, a sacralized proposition for people, even though I don't think it should be. So um, to answer your question, religion is uh, a good place to start when thinking about what I call the attitude of religious credence, because as I was saying, it gives you sort of a more pure form of it. Um, but it's certainly not the only place that religion is not the only place that you'll find religious credence or groupish believing as a more general attitude uh, will appear in, in, in lots of different places. And I think one of the one of the ugly facts about um, at least, you know, contemporary American culture is that more and more of the subject matters that ought to be left to factually believing at attitudes or or maybe probabilistic uh, uh, attitudes are being taken over as sacralized by tribal identities. And so I hope one thing that my book offers is a toolkit for helping to think about what's going on in, in that kind of situation. Is Are you offering a, a, a kind of individual toolkit for, for kind of introspective filtering, let's say, and, and reflection on ideas, or are you suggesting perhaps some cultural movement or some approach to the ways in which ideas are communicated and shared, maybe academically or otherwise, that, that might help to offset what you're talking about, in effect? Well, I do say, to answer the first part of the question first, I do say in the epilogue of my book that I, I hope people have resources for reflecting on their own beliefs because I feel often people can be bullied into having religious credences about this or that. And the, the first thing that could be an antidote to that is just getting clear in your own mind what your psychological state, what your own psychological states are, like the Delphic, Delphic Oracle says, know thyself, okay? So I do, I do hope to offer um, help with that. I can't say that I have a picture in mind of how we as a society can can um, you know fight the the sacralization of things that shouldn't be sacralized. I wish I did. I sure wish I did. I don't have it. Um, but so mainly, yes, a tool for introspection. I think that can be valuable for lots more than just academics. And then also um, a, a hypothesis generator for academic research. I hope to to reach uh, a lot of anthropologists and psychologists and religious studies scholars, and hopefully give them some conceptual tools to incorporate in their own research design. Thank you for that. I mean, we give five stars to philosophers who mention Greek references uh, when talking to us, and also who admit they don't have all the answers. I think these are two really, really good things that, uh, that move you high up the table uh, of, of preferred uh, thinkers on this. It's a really interesting area. We're, we're uh, running slightly short of time, but let's, uh, Dimitri, if you want to chime in with any questions or, or things, and we can obviously, perhaps we can, we can invite uh, uh, Neil um, for another interview to drill into some of these areas in more depth at another time. But I'll, let me hand over to you for, for any questions. Yeah, um, just a bit of clarification, um, um, Professor. Um, true versus distinctive. Uh, the role of belonging or non-belonging in a group, as you have uh, um, 
stated. Um, so being in the in-group or the out-group uh, often has an impact on the way a person approves, rejects, or reflects upon a situation uh, unfolding in front of his eyes. Are truthfulness and distinctiveness in relation to mundane and religious beliefs affected by factors other than in-group or out-group pers perspective? And if we assume that uh, both belief cases share an element of truth, uh, before making the distinction between uh, true versus distinctive. Could moral ethical criteria make the difference towards uh, one's quest for truth? Yeah, so I, I like that question. Let me start by just walking the audience who's, who's watching through the issue of true versus distinctive. So with mundane beliefs, the idea is that with mundane beliefs and factual beliefs, they tend to do their instrumental job well if they're true. So, so for example, hence the name of the, the paper, if I, if I factually believe that the, the switch is connected to the light, look, you can even see it, right? I'm going to flip the switch, right? Lights, lights changing. So if my belief is true that the switch is connected to the light, then I can illuminate the room and it works. If, if it's not true, then I might turn on the garbage disposal by accident, right? And my, my belief fails at what it's supposed to do. So that's factual beliefs. They work well if they're true. Whereas group beliefs, they have to be distinctive to define an in-group. So if I, if I uh, groupishly believe, say that um, my ancestors walked the forest or something like that, that's something that's more distinctive and specific to my community. Okay, and it, in order to make a community around a certain belief, the belief doesn't really need to be true. It just has to be distinctive of our group. So true is what factual beliefs need. Distinctive is what groupish belief groupish beliefs need to define to, to define the in group well. And those can obviously be very much in tension with each other. Sometimes false or evidentially distorted beliefs actually oftentimes false or evidentially distorted beliefs, they can be better internal markers of a given in-group because they're more likely to be distinctive. Okay, so that's that's the background, that's the background idea. So, okay, so I just set that up. So what was, what was the follow-up of question that you were asking here? Um, yeah, uh, could moral ethical criteria make the difference towards one, one's quest for truth? Could more alethic criteria make a difference? Ethical. Ethical. Well, ethical. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, um, Immanuel Kant uh, once said, uh, I had to deny knowledge in order to make room for faith uh, during his spiritual journey. Uh, he didn't actually mean that he had to reject his own scientific theories so as to embrace um, a religion but he actually recognized the limits of science and the fact that some truths are not justified by evidence alone, uh, but also justified by morality. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, in that respect, and uh, because of the fact that both neuroscience and psychology tell us that people are no equal, but differ in everything. Um, what would you have to say regarding um, um, spirituality and um, um, uh, religion uh, in, 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 in relation to science? Uh, are they actually fundamentally opposed or can they, can they coexist in harmony? Well, it sure depends upon the religion uh, that you're talking about. Um, so as I was telling you before we started the interview, I went to a Quaker high school and I think, you know, Quaker religion uh, leaves a lot of room open for scientific discovery. But there are um, some religious movements that actively uh, contest as part of their, their religious identity, actively contest known scientific findings, right? Like the processes of, of evolution over millions and even billions of years has been very well proven in biology. And, and then also the, the age of the earth, but young earth creationists 
are going to deny all that. So, so that brand of religion, just in terms of the contents there, um, is going to be, uh, at least logically speaking, the doctrines and the stories are incompatible with known scientific results. So I wouldn't want to say as a um, broad sweeping claim that religion and science are in conflict with one another. And in fact, it's it's more so in some cultures than in others that it's seen that way. And there's some very interesting uh, cross-cultural psychology on this, this very issue. But I think, I think it certainly can uh, be the case. And uh, unfortunately for a lot of um, evangelical Christians in the United States, there is that tension there. And so that's a, that's a conflict. We, we see it all around us. And have you, all around me. Thank, thank you for that. Have you, based following from that, have you engaged with what you might call the rational arguments that are used by apologists? And there are some quite famous apologists who often engage in debate with atheists. Uh, it's a big mm -hmm. kind of online thing, let's say. So who will quote things like the fine tuning argument or the design argument or even the cosmological argument as both philosophical and uh, 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 rational arguments that they would argue, let's imagine one of them's in here, they would argue that therefore this takes the group belief, the make belief that, that you're talking about into something different, into a probabilistic or a, or a logically uh, assumed uh, inference uh, about the universe, uh, leaving aside, let's say, the empirical resurrection argument, which is also actually sometimes put forward. But let's mm -hmm. take those slightly more theoretical arguments. Um, how do you, where do you put those in your, in your, in your duality of, of uh, approaches to, to what's real and what isn't? Well, I think I think the psychology of religious apologists are is well described by my view. And what I would want to say is that the activity of engaging in religious apology is is part of the make believe game. I don't think that the at the end of the day, the religious apologists are actually open to revising their beliefs in light of evidence, their religious credences in light of evidence, but rather their, their um, attempts to make arguments are part of the in-group signaling that they engage in, right? So it's a way of one, pushing, you know, pushing the critics of religion away, but two, uh, it's also a way of saying, okay, I'm a, I'm a smart academic type, but I'm still part of I'm still part of say the Christian Reformed Church in in my case, or or part of um, uh, you know this or that sect of Islam uh, in in the case of of uh, an Islamic theologian, and and so on. So that's my general take on on religious apologists. So I don't bother, frankly, to try to refute the fine tuning argument. I mean, I think that's a perfectly valuable exercise. I think it's it's perhaps more interesting for my purposes to answer the question, well, what are incredibly smart people doing when they make these, I think, transparently fairly bad arguments? Interesting. Thank you so much for that. We're in our last minute. So I just, uh, before we, we, I hope we will meet again, but just before we run out of time, let's say thanks very much to Dr. Van Lewin. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much, Neil. Was a and, very uh, obviously, uh, do look out for the for the book and the paper, and uh, follow Neil online where you find him. As for there we go, how about that? There we go. There um, we go. There's no doubt that's definitely a true picture of a true book that that exists in true reality. So uh, we're we're very pleased to see it, and we'll um, I hope we'll speak again, and uh, you know, wish you a lot of success with with this important work. Uh, Demetrius, do you want to uh, wind up on behalf of the group? Uh, thank you very much for presenting us your views uh, regarding religion as make-believe, and uh, we hope to see you again. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care.